All right. Well, welcome today. It is July 15th, 2021. For those watching in the future, we have an incredible uh, treat for you today. It's our V-Lab with Betsy, and it's on Go Green and Live Well with Sustainable Real Estate. And one of our bright and best here, Betsy Luttrell, is going to take us through some of uh, some great tips and practices of this. We're really excited. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Betsy, and I will, uh, if you have any questions, David, or anybody else that joins, obviously, feel free to jump in. And those in the future can reach out to Betsy Direct for, um, she has a wealth of knowledge. So, so grateful for you to share some of that today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Teddy. And hello, VFAM, those here now and in the future. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, let me get my presentation going. I've got a Let's see here. Oh, they've got the new. Okay. So, um, excited to have this platform to talk to a whole bunch of realtors um, about my knowledge and passion for sustainability and how that intersects with um, architecture, construction, and real estate. Well, just briefly touching, you'll see this, this image is from a project called Glow Community in Bainbridge Island, Washington. There's a couple images I share from it because I think it kind of exemplifies um, a lot of these concepts in the wild. So got some eye candy for you. Um, a little bit about me. I am a licensed eco architect and builder and a licensed realtor. Um, and I have all of those licenses centered on sustainability. Um, so I blend those skill sets for uh, inspired green living. Uh, my husband and I have a um, boutique architecture and construction company that we started in 2019 um, called Maypop Building Workshop. Uh, Maypop is the nickname for Tennessee State Wildflower, the passion flower. And it is aggressively resilient. It's like elect ec ec ecologically abundant and restorative, and it's just really pretty as well. So um, those are some of our guiding principles for our firm. Um, and before this, I worked at Manuel Zeitlin Architects, Smith G Studio, and the National Civic Design Center. Um, and all throughout all of those jobs, I cared a lot about this <laughs> and ultimately ended up getting my real estate license um, because as a frustrated architect, why well, nobody could get sustainability in a project. And it turns out it hinges on valuation and realtors are at the frontier of this movement. Um, and so I got my license in 2017. I've been with Village since 2018 under Lee Fund's guidance. I keep following him around to different uh, brokerages. So, hey boo, thanks for all your guidance, Lee. And of course, everyone else at Village. It's fantastic um, business and community to be a part of. So anywho, that's a little bit about me. Essentially, I'm kind of nature. Oh, also important on Village. Um, I am, I have my NAR Green designation and I'm one of 48 uh, realtors in the nation on NAR's Sustainability Advisory Group, which is freaking awesome. Somehow I wiggled into there, I tend to do that. Um, and it is a mixed bag of folks from appraisal, land use, they have NAR leadership, but it just kind of is interdisciplinary lens that they're using to come at sustainability and resiliency in the real estate market. Um, because of the climate, uh, climate emergency we're experiencing, um, there are certain places that have 30-year mortgages now that may not have 30-year mortgages in the near future um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's a big deal and uh, better late than never. Now we're, and now we're trying to kind of, they're putting a lot of money into it. There's a lot of stuff in the backdrop that'll be tools for realtors to do uh, better work and lead the charge because really we are at the frontier there. So um, high level presentation. I've got my some notes here um, so I don't miss too much good stuff. Um, obviously sustainability is a huge topic. There's um, and I'm trying to give a high level presentation of how you can be part of the solution um, because it is urgent and imperative and it can be fun and awesome too. So um, as my sustainable realtor mentor Craig Foley out of the Boston market um, says there are 50 shades of green and um, you and you, your clients, you can dip your toes in, you can do a swan dive, any of the above, 
I like to say, get in where you fit in and um, don't let perfection stand in the way of progress. So lots of stuff to do. Um, starter, starting off just high level green living. This is, you know, one of the ways that I kind of, besides architecture school and exposure there, um, green living is a great way to um, get involved in the movement. Here's my dog, Gracie, and a prize cabbage several years back. I did not work hard to grow that. Nature knows how to grow big ass cabbages on its own. Um, and, you know, it's just really fun to kind of be a part of the bounty and the genius that nature offers. Um, great closing gifts um, and ways to support you and your client's lifestyle. Um, essentially, this is kind of just showing durable goods. We're running out of land. Uh, landfills are filling up and recycling is important, but a lot of times that means shipping things to China. So that's kind of counterintuitive. Um, so you can invest in a couple of things like this. Um, down at the bottom left is bees wrap. It's a food wrap with bees wraps. It's a plastic wrap. Um, I mean, all of this stuff is just real napkins, you know, cloth napkins, they're kind of fancy and then you don't have to pay for a lot of paper towels. Um, bonus is that glass and stainless steel do not leach chemicals into food or water. So that's a huge bonus. Um, so that's good. Uh, local food and just plants in general are another great kind of entry entry point into the movement. Again, at the top left, this is a blackberry that nature grew in my backyard. There, it just did it. Um, we have a 0.15 acre yard in Wedgwood, Houston, and we've done a lot of cool stuff there. Um, backyard hens, I mean, that's some of the best TV you can watch at the end of a stressful day. It's this chicken scratching around. Um, we had an aquaponics greenhouse where we were growing tilapia and vegetables in our backyard, if you could believe it. Um, but thankfully, lots of local farmers um, make it much easier and cheaper for you to eat local fresh organic vegetables. And when you support them, you support their stewardship of the earth and collectively they manage um, tracts of land and ensure we have clean water and clean, and clean food. So that's great. Um, House plants can clean air and instill, you know, uh, feelings of well-being. So these are all kind of entry Entry wellness is the gateway to sustainability because they really go hand in hand. Um, worms, we compost for, we do use worms to compost our compost in a basement tub. And uh, then we make worm tea for our garden and it's just like black gold. Um, so pretty cool, nature's awesome. You should play with it. Um, green building, green building, is the product of green design. Of course, here's that project again. This is Grow Community in Bainbridge Island. Um, here you can see it's got, you know, aesthetically, it's my jam. It's got a warm, modern aesthetic, very tactile, clean lines, but even more important, you're starting to see some sophistication in the site plan um, that makes opportunities for connection, privacy, food production, wildlife, wildlife habitat, energy production, um, and it's just really cool. So these are the kinds of communities we can have with a little intention and the power of design to, um, obviously there's a pro forma and a developer in here somewhere, but um, they made it work. So let's see here, very important, green building. Okay, um, this is the appraisals. Appraisal Institute definition of green building. Um, this will be the only thing I'll really read to you today, but it's the practice of creating structures and using processes that are environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout a building's life cycle from siting to design, construction, operation, maintenance, renovation, and deconstruction. This practice expands and complements the classic building concerns of economy, utility, durability, and comfort. So you, U.S. Um, EPA definition and high performance building and green building are often used interchangeably. interchangeably. Um, that is from the Appraisal Institute. Um, I will say that buildings are complex structures. They have multiple intertwined systems and exist in dynamic environments like diverse occupant requirements and behaviors. So that's a lot of stuff going on. Um, COVID really helped bring this to the forefront of everyone's mind as we instantly demanded a lot more of our homes and our buildings and prayed that they would keep us healthy from some of the threats in the world. Um, 
again, there are 50 shades of green, and I'm going to talk about green building through a framework that I think is important and kind of isolates um, opportunities and concepts in a hopefully a little bit more structured and palatable way. Um, and of course, as realtors in the spirit of selling benefits and not features, um, green building is a natural byproduct when you design for durability, comfort, efficiency, wellness, and delight. Um, if you go for that, you will end up with a green building. Um, okay, so green building. Um, obviously, I'm gonna cram a lot into this presentation. Let me watch my clock here. About to get real. Um, okay, so humans consume resources. That's no surprise there. Um, this slide in particular is talking about the resources that create energy that we use in our buildings. There are two types of resources, finite, um, limited quantity, and access relies on extraction and typically results in depletion. Um, petroleum, natural gas, and coal are all examples of resources for the earth, for energy that there's only a limited amount and they're hard to get to. Um, other resources that are really important to keep in mind um, and probably most valuable are our time, our physical and emotional energy, our health, and our money. We've only got limited amounts of that and um, sustainability principles and investments give you the biggest return on investment for those important resources. Um, typically, it has to be viewed for a long-term lens versus a short-term lens, um, but long-term, you're in better shape. So renewable um, is abundant and constantly replenished. This is an example, solar energy is an example of renewable energy. Um, there are passive, so we're gonna be talking about systems as passive and active systems. Um, passive means they just do what they do by nature of how they exist. Um, active means they're actively participating and doing something. Um, in the bottom right, it's kind of talking to the uh, passive solar design. And this refers to how you can site, locate a building on a property and design it um, in a way that it works with the sun's path. We are in the Northern hemisphere. The sun is always to the South, mostly. Um, and here's an example of this. It's a projectable path through the sky, and we can design and site our buildings in a way that accepts excess light and energy in the winter when we want it and reject it in the summer when we do not need it. Um, so that's a concept for passive solar energy. Um, active solar energy. And on the left, this is an example of solar panels. These, this is just a system that actively produces energy from sun's rays. Thankfully, a lot of people know what that is nowadays. Um, and in real estate, um, that's effectively a power plant on your building. And we'll get into how that translates to valuation down the road, but it's pretty cool. Um, those same solar panels could also be hot water panels and you can preheat hot water for domestic hot water heating and pools and things like that. Um, geothermal is another renewable energy down here on the left. Essentially, you hook a building's HVAC system, you tie it to the earth. The earth has huge mass and it's at a constant temperature at a known depth. And um, you use the earth to preheat refrigerant in the winter. You know, in the, in the winter, it could be zero degrees outside, but the earth is like 55 degrees where it's exchanging heat. So you've got 55 degrees that are already preheated for you. So that's a lot of energy savings. And in reverse, in the summer, um, the earth can accept excess heat from the house um, in a really efficient way. So geothermal, the earth is always going to be big in that temperature, and so that's a renewable resource. Um, wind and wave are other examples uh, that are very effective, but not really applicable to Middle Tennessee's uh, region. So then, now that we've talked about resources and um, what they are, we how we can be efficient with them, resource efficiency. Um, this is really important for a lot of reasons, but mostly there are a lot of people on the planet, <laughs> currently about 7.7 .7 billion people. Um, industrial revolution, it took all of human history until around 1800 
for the population to reach 1 billion. Second billion achieved by 1930, third billion by 1960, fourth billion by 1974, fifth billion by 87. We're up to 8 billion by 2020 and expected to be 10 billion by 2050. So um, I don't think it has to move the space to fix the problem. Um, and I know planet Earth will be okay. It's just that our humans are gonna be around. <laughs> um, so essentially we need to do more with less very quickly. Luckily, this is very doable. Um, this slide showcases daylighting. Um, this is just a simple concept to use glazing and ambient light uh, for illumination and views. It saves energy and can help with task execution and of course connects you to in our fast paced, highly technical, highly stressful, highly busy world. We're experiencing a lot of illness because we've basically become robots, <laughs> industrialized people. So daylight also connects you to nature in a way that um, reconnects you to your circadian rhythms and can instill feelings of well-being. Um, getting out of the rat race, so, so to speak. So that's a simple concept. Um, up here, let me just show on the, this uh, high windows on the left, those are called transom windows. They bring windows up, they bring light in from top of the wall. On the right is an example of solar camps. Um, I actually have one of these in my living room, and it's awesome. Um, Mindy Week, or Betsy Week, are you there? Yeah. I think we lost some of your audio. Is everyone else noticed that too? Okay, yeah. It's kind of cracking in and out. Let's. Um... Are you on an earbud or anything? No, I let this come naturally. Yeah, all right. Your presentation's fine. Your audio just cut out a bit. So that's where we wanted to. Uh, are you frozen or are you just looking in awe here? What's happening? Does he come back? Might be that. Am I back? Yes. Yeah, it'll I can kind of hear you. Maybe something's covering the microphone. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Just keep talking, Betsy. Okay. Give us. Yeah, put your presentation. You can put your presentation back up in that presentation mode. That's great. So we can see it that way. It was just your just audio call. that had cut okay. back. Got really faint. Let's see here. It just it's it's like it comes and goes a little bit. So yeah, we want to make sure you're. Um... That's strange because I did. I'm on the V agent network. <laughs> That's okay. Can you give me a couple of testing one two threes or something like so I can try to hear you, Betsy? Can everybody hear her enough? You turn it up. All right, Betsy, go ahead. Continue, please. All right. Give it a whirl. Um, so, resource efficiency. Now we're moving into nitty gritty uh, energy systems. So again, going back to passive and active systems, you have some earbuds over there, you're thinking? I'm wondering if the mic on the computer, if that's, it's, it, 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 it sounded fine and now it kind of pops in and out where you, you sound muted and then you're, um, and then you come quick. 
Yeah, you're certainly welcome to log out real quick and log back on if you don't have earbuds there by chance. Let me try that. Oh, Sorry. wait, you sound, you sound great. Cool. Got to threaten it. I think so. I sound great. Yeah. Do I still sound great? Yeah, but go ahead and go ahead and log off and log back on and, and um, we'll be here for you. I'm going to pause the recording. Okay. We're back. Back. All right. Awesome. So back on resource efficiency, um, this has to do with energy management. And this is going back to passive versus active systems. Uh, the building envelope is a term used in architecture um, and design is essentially the skin of a building um, that interfaces between inside and outside, um, otherwise known as floors, walls, and roof. And um, the floor, the envelope is made of different assemblies, floor assemblies, wall assemblies, roof assemblies that uh, do a lot of hard work. Um, let me see where I was here. Okay, so one of the big things with high performance building, um, a motto is build tight, ventilate right. Um, and essentially, um, we spend all this money on the house and conditioning air and water um, we don't want that energy to just leak out through our building, um, through our windows and doors and walls. And also, uh, that's the build type part. Ventilate right has to do with acknowledging now we have much tighter buildings and um, we need fresh air <laughs> as humans inside of them to live a healthy life. So instead of letting air creep up you know, creep in where we don't want it to, say, through a crawl space with a dead raccoon, things like that. We can actually control where we're getting fresh air from and how much fresh air we're doing to make sure that we're optimizing interior uh, environments for human comfort. So these are elements that are found in a building enclosure, building envelope. Um, there's several metrics that relate to um, their ability to manage energy flow, i.e. save save money. Um, when, so there's opaque walls and then there's transparent walls, windows, skylights. Um, for opaque walls, you typically hear the term R value uh, as it re refers to the insulation, levels of insulation within a wall or roof or floor. Um, and there are code prescribed requirements for that. And on our translucent um, walls, our windows and doors, there's a couple other metrics as you can imagine, walls you can see through um, are pretty awesome, and we need those to work a little harder. Um, and so the metrics used to describe their ability to resist um, heat transfer is a U factor. So you'll see U factor is just the other side of R value, literally the mathematical inverse. Um, and it talks about how much, it's basically the insulation level of a window. In addition to that, SHGC stands for solar heating gain coefficient, how much radiant energy gets into the home. Um, and you'll wanna optimize that based on the windows to the south and facing the sun or to the north and not facing the sun. And then when you get into skylights and translucent panels, there's visible light transmittance which is a metric that is just about the balance of energy. It's a fine line between visual transparency and um, thermal resistance. Um, in the bottom right, that's an example of a blower door test. So high performance buildings um, and third party rating systems, essentially they require blower doors to make sure the building is tight enough um, so it doesn't leak energy. Um, and they essentially pressurize the building and measure how quickly it loses air uh, to understand how many air changes it has and how much energy it will leak. They use the same technology for ducts and duct work. Um, so those are just performance tests. And this all governs passive um, systems, the so building enclosure. When you start to get into um, HVAC and hot water, 
and I will even add dehumidification to that. These are active systems. Um, they account, HVAC alone accounts for about 35% of a building's um, energy use. And these systems are very important. They dynamically change our environment, so based on the weather. And um, I'm of the growing opinion that homes should be designed when possible to be all electric systems, such that they could be offset with renewable um, energies um, now or in the future. And luckily, loads of other people do too, and there's a lot of really awesome solutions out there. Um, heat pumps. So going back to geothermal, geothermal is a heat pump. A heat pump refers to a technology um, that essentially reverses energy flow um, with the weather and the climate. The easiest way to think about it, again, is that they preheat refrigerant in the winter and they um, reject excess heat in the summer. So geothermal is an example of a ground source heat pump, you're utilizing the ground to preheat and as a heat sink, and more commonly are air source heat pumps. Um, there are a lot of homes, and they just utilize the air. They're really efficient technology, and they can do that same principle, not as good as geothermal, but still really damn good, um, and exchange energy that way. So that diagram at the bottom is just talking about how that flow is reversed seasonally. Um, at the top left, this is so with heat pumps, um, the way that the refrigerant flows is really important as well. Uh, variable refrigerant flow versus constant refrigerant, refrigerant flow are kind of like a dimmer switch versus an on-off switch. Variable refrigerant flow um, is the new awesome way to use to have a heat pump um, and essentially at the top left you can see that this is a whole system and it is sending different amounts of energy to different rooms based on the occupant request for comfort so you, there's a lot of zoning it's really these systems are super quiet um, super efficient and responsive so pretty awesome most people think of them just as the duct list with the wall box units, and that is one example of an, a cassette that blows air, but these systems actually, you can hide them in the wall, you can hide them in the roof. Um, they actually have forced air uh, variable refrigerant flow systems now too. So you basically replace your air handler, use your existing ducts, but you're getting that efficiency of the refrigerant flow. So that's pretty cool. Um, to the right is a heat pump water heater, and this is the same concept. Um, it's electric heat pump water heater, so it has that same efficiency built into it. Um, moving on, active system again, smart home. This is another great entryway in sustainability and high-performance homes. Um, and smart homes basically refer to technology that governs all sorts of um, all sorts of systems. Um, HVAC, and actually I realized I'm missing an important component on this screen. So going back to business systems, this is HVAC and hot water. High performance homes also needed fresh air, dedicated fresh air source, so uh, dedicated ventilation. And in humid climate, the new school of thought is dedicated dehumidification. Once you get these really efficient coolers that people live in, um, your HVAC system, is, the loads are, the cooling loads are so small um, that an air conditioner will shut off when there's still dehumidification to be done to ensure that mold doesn't grow and that it's a healthy environment. So in addition to ventilation and distributing hot and cold air, there's typically a secondary system that can be integrated um, that delivers fresh air and optimally dehumidifies it in a climate like ours. So going back to smart home, these are just technology solutions that govern everything from appliances to security, um, all the things that we've been talking about. Water efficiency, you know, we're blessed to have an abundance of this amazing resource. A lot of people don't. It's not guaranteed into the future that we will. There have been some serious 
droughts in Atlanta, and a member of, if everybody remembers the war between water between Chattanooga and Atlanta, and I would say that, you know, we, again, we need to do more with less, and why shouldn't we? Um, low flow water fixtures and toilets save a lot of water, um, saving rainwater for garden irrigation, you know, ensures we can, we're not using potable water for that really, um, for that task composting toilet on the on the, on the um, bottom left here. Um, this big fan composting toilet. So well, we're going to get to the real estate stuff. So, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, healthy, durable materials and design. So this just is on the topic that specifications matter. And there are healthy and unhealthy materials that affect human health. And their source and processing affects our planet health. So um, spec specifications matter a lot, actually. Um, biophilic design is a term that refers to design that celebrates and utilizes nature's genius. Um, here are a couple gorgeous materials uh, you might not see every day. Of course, I want to bring some stuff to the table that you may not see every day. Um, I realize these are probably outliers in the standard market, but meant to inspire. At the top left, these are uh, mineral-based and clay-based paints. So again, you get the color, but they've got like a soft tactility, which is really awesome. FSC Wood on the bottom left, that's Forest Stewardship Council. And it just basically says that tracts of land were not deforested to make a make houses. Um, we need that type of lens. Uh, we need to manage our forest systems appropriately such that we can use that long term. Germany and Europe, I mean, they, man, they have spectacular forage man, forest management systems. Um, so they can do it, we can do it. They have way less land, too. Um, top right, this is thermally modified wood. This is pine. You basically cook it, cook the hell out of it, and it becomes um, dimensionally stable and um, aesthetically uniform. It's pretty cool. I'll show you on the next page. Um, cork, different colored corks on the bottom right. This is the top, of, this is the best of the best here. Um, top left is acetylated wood. Akoya is a brand of wood. The wood screening that has, can have up to a 50 year siding because of the way that they treat this wood. I mean, that's not really known. Um, wood, wood doesn't typically have that. Rammed earth is at the top right. This is actually utilizing local soil and Portland cement. And look at that gorgeous, variation. I mean, who needs art when your walls look like that? That's pretty amazing. Cork on the bottom left. Cork is a renewable resource. You actually don't cut down the trees to get to it. The trees come pretty much mostly from Portugal, um, and which is a far away way, but um, trees do not die and they keep regenerating. And it's very durable. It manages moisture and it's pretty freaking cool. Um, and then bamboo is another rapidly renewable resource on the bottom right, and there's all sorts of materials made out of bamboo. Let me do a time check here. Okay. Um, so those are durable, healthy materials. Huge, huge, huge part of the conversation for sustainability um, is durable design. You know, uh, another architect mentor, Stephen Basic, he likes to say if it doesn't last, it doesn't matter, and that is so important. Um, and going back to our building envelope and the skin of the building that interfaces between the inside and the outside, it has a lot of heavy lifting to do. We're very spoiled nowadays to be able to exist in 72 degree air year round, but little do we know that our building is doing a lot of hard work. Um, building enclosures should solve four problems, otherwise known as four control layers. And they are in this order of importance. Um, bulk water, obviously, we've got to keep the water out of the building because rot, mold, all of those things. The first thing you need to ensure is that your building can resist storms and rain. Um, second control layer would be air and continuous air barriers. Um, one, because we lose energy when air moves. But two, we lose and gain energy. Sometimes we don't want energy in the summer. We don't want that heat in our house. Um, but even more importantly is that with air comes a lot of moisture, vapor and moisture in the air. So by controlling air, we control water. Um, and then moving down, 
to the vapor moisture layer. Um, the new school of thought, so again, build tight, ventilate right, and we ideally we would have airtight and vapor open assemblies. You know, we have dy dynamic assemblies, climates change, and um, we need to allow moisture to go both directions and design our assemblies to dry. Um, so, and then finally, thermal. Thermal is very important, but it's actually the fourth of importance. A lot of people just want to throw a lot of insulation in this in the things and insulation is great, um, but we need, this is the order of priority and all four of these need to be solved to ensure that we've got durability, uh, comfort, efficiency with resources um, and sustainability and a great return on your investment for all the time, energy and resources you put to build the building. Um, this is a company out of the Northeast. They are awesome. Um, they are focusing on helping with low carbon, high performance building, which is the niche that we're going on. Kind of, I will segue into what the hell that means in a moment. Um, of course, in the house too, clean air, clean air, water and house. Um, there are whole house filtration systems uh, for water and air that are important. New construction, we all know about radon by now. And um, those can be retrofitted very easily. And in new construction, you know, it's a cakewalk to plan for those things. You just lay some PV, perforated PVC pipe in the slab and vent it through the roof and add, a, add an outlet in the attic for a future fan if you need it. Um, obviously, COVID has everyone thinking about air ventilation and filtration. There are whole house filtration systems with MERV ratings uh, and just making sure you change your, I mean, these are, again, easy ways to make a healthy home. Taking shoes off at the door because there's all, like, all sorts of crazy stuff that comes in on the shoe, um, changing your air filters so your HVAC doesn't have to work as hard and um, the lifespan of your HVAC system lasts longer. Um, cleaning, I mean, operation is a huge part of green building and green living. You can make a super green, awesome building, but then if you start like using some really crazy uh, toxic stuff to clean it, all of that stuff gets trapped inside with you. So using you know plant-based healthy ways to clean and uh, your home and yourself inside your home is great and of course VOCs um, refer to volatile organic compounds that exist in materials and we want zero or low VOC materials in our house because these things off gas and um, we don't want that in our lungs we want to manage it um, so back to the carbon um, this is a big one, and actually it made me hopeful. <laughs> Again, I almost know too much to be hopeful sometimes, but um, carbon makes me hopeful. So there's two types of carbon. There's embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, to date, most everybody's been thinking about operational carbon, right? We want ener energy efficient buildings. I want to save energy while I'm using my building, and that is very, very, very important, and we've gotten really good at solutions for that. Um, the big elephant in the room is the embodied carbon. Um, what did, what's the tax on the planet to get it to the building to be efficient? Um, and this concept of the built environment as a carbon sink, this basically uses a low carbon, high performance refers to this. Um, you basically build with plants because plants are smart. They're amazing. Plants grow. They absorb you know, uh, carbon dioxide in the air. They store it in their, uh, inside itself. And then when we make materials with plants, we store that carbon in the built environment. And if this was done at scale, we could cool the climate. It's a climate cooling strategy. Obviously it's not done at scale yet, but it's freaking awesome. Um, side note is that plants are really ha healthy <laughs> for the most part. They're not trying to kill you. So you put all much plants in your building and you design for durability, you've got a really healthy, awesome building that's helping, you know, fight the climate emergency. Um, and so the building has a carbon sink. Great news is that one of the best ways to do this, the best places to do this is in your building envelope. Just insulation choices alone uh, can have a huge impact. Um, and this is a a graph from a gentleman um, 
named Chris Magwood. He's a leader in this front. And it basically shows embodied carbon. Um, so essentially the green means that these, these materials um, store carbon by making them. So straw bale, hempcrete, cork, dense pack, dense pack cellulose, and wool are all insulation types that help cool the climate. Um, and in orange, these are insulation choices that have a heavier tax on the planet. A lot of this is new school of thought, so this is not to shame anybody that's using any of these. Um, this is more no better, do better kind of stuff um, because there's a lot of operating efficiency that comes from the items in orange, but we can get that same operating efficiency with different systems, and I will show you how. So uh, low carbon, high performance. This is an example of, this is actually wood fiber insulation, um, Gutex. Um, it's from German, sustainably managed forests in Germany. Um, so this has to come a long way, but even shipped by uh, ships to the U.S., it's storing carbon because of the efficiency of their forest systems and the products. So instead of pink rigid foam, Continuous insulation is important for a building, it's like a sweater for the building, and it's the equivalent of not having your toe out of the cover in the bed, and you, you get cold that way. So continuous insulation is important, um, and we have plant-based products that can do that, that store carbon. Um, take note of this, because I'm going to show you a project, thrilled to be working on a project in Nashville that we're going to do this on. Um, hempcrete, this is awesome. Hemp is an amazing, I mean, I think the sails on Christopher Columbus's boat were made of hemp. You know, the first flag, Betsy Ross made of hemp. Hemp is amazing. It does a lot of great stuff, food, medicine, fiber. Um, hempcrete is concrete that uses hemp curds as part of the, part of the mix. Uh, incredibly durable, fire resistant, super healthy. It actually absorbs um, negative ions and cleans the air and continues to cure. I mean, it's just crazy. Nature is amazing. We just need to put it in, put it in coach. Um, I am cuckoo for these amazing things here. Um, this is Eco Cocoon. They are essentially straw bale Legos. So modern materials are so fantastic. You know, 20 years ago, there was a lot of cool, awesome, crunchy people with straw bales and handfuls of mud um, that were doing buildings that had this type of impact. Obviously, we can't do that at scale, and that would be really expensive, and it's not a good solution. This is a company out of Lithuania, I believe, and um, it's prefabrication. I firmly believe prefabrication is the future. You're getting precision-based Legos that get set up in a day. They store carbon. They're shipped. Again, they're from across the world currently, um, but as we support these industries in America, I mean, this is crazy because the global cereal grains, uh, rice, all the straw, everything that would go into a straw bale, globally, those plants every year soak up enough carbon dioxide to offset our global transportation emissions. So every year, the earth has been like, I got you, y'all, I got your carbon, and then we just burn it and throw it away. If we were instead to direct that resource into our built environment, you know, we'd be a lot better. So these are really cool. Going to stay tuned. If you want to do a project like this, let me know. I'm going to get one soon. Um, this is that straw bale. This is an example of the house. That is made of straw bale Legos, but you would never know it. Um, thermal comfort, acoustic comfort, just all the good stuff. So going on again to moving on to eco-landscape foodscapes. This is obviously the soft side of built environment and an awesome, great inroad for people. Um, wildlife habitat, pollinator-friendly gardens, foodscapes, you know, grow food, not lawn movement, or at least some food. Um, Perennial plants, food producing plants, are actually real property um, versus annual or personal property. That's why you can use uh, crops with USDA loans to help finance the loan. Like if you're buying a farm orchard, some of the income off the real property could be used to qualify for the loan. So it's pretty cool. I'm very interested in perennial foodscapes as real property. Um, here's examples of ways to incorporate. This is a green roof meadow. Um, that's awesome. They have companies that do that in really thin soil. Of course, your top farms, um, native there escaping, all sorts of cool stuff like that. Pavers, structural pavers you can drive on, but grow glass. And of course, just connection to the outdoors. 
Um, let's see, and then of course into the good stuff, green real estate. How does all this intersect green real estate? It's all awesome and amazing, and how can we see more of it? Um, here's another example of a cool lady in that Grow community project. Um, this is multifamily that was there. Um, they actually used the HOA to HOA dues govern um, foodscaping management, et cetera. So that's pretty cool. Um, great inroad for anybody that's like, hey, this is really cool. I want to learn more. Um, NAR has a green designation. It's a two-day class, really easy. You can see it in person. You can watch it online. And it's a great way to show clients that you care about this um, and you know a little bit about it. Um, market, price, cost, and value. So resource-efficient homes are becoming the expectation. Quite frankly, they're becoming the requirement by a lot of municipalities. Uh, the energy code is real. Metro Nashville just went from 2009 energy code standards to 2018. That's a big deal for the built environment. Um, it's a challenge for our workforce and our trades, but the wolf keeps the caribou strong, and I know that we'll figure it out. Um, so, yeah, this stuff is coming whether you like it or not. Buildings are going to get greener. They're going to go away from just fancy counters and floors into fancy counters, floors, and produce energy and make you healthier. Um, they're an investment. So, you know, it's a huge opportunity to niche down and focus on this. Um, cost savings, health, sustainability, and lifestyle, wellness, huge, huge trend, um, and main drivers. But, of course, proper valuation is a big challenge in many markets. Um, and valuation is key. Again, this, this singular page is why I have my real estate license, and I'm thrilled to be here with you. Um, and the picture on the bottom left shows a row house. Um, the one that is dark blue, that building basically has a sweater on it. Um, and as you can see, the red is energy loss. So the building with a sweater on it um, is not leaking as much energy. If this was a daytime shot, they would all look the same. Um, but because of nighttime, or because of thermal imaging, you can actually tell the performance. So a lot of the things I'm talking about are invisible for the most part, but there's tremendous value. So how do we quantify that? Um, I have full faith we can solve this because clearly we are helping with appraisal gaps like crazy right now. We can go to go to bat for our clients and bring all the information together. Um, so if for example, the blue house versus the one to the left of it. If this, within this real estate transaction, someone, let's just say the $300,000, one on the left was $300,000 to build, and uh, the one on the right was $325,000 to build. Um, this builder should be able, or the client that had it invested in that, should be able to recoup that value on the market because it's a different type of building that uses less energy that translates to income and health. Um, if the, within the real estate transaction that value is not identified, there is an appraisal gap and you need to cover that with cash. So by helping the industry, uh, by helping value high performance buildings in the industry, we allow regular people with outloads of cash to buy healthy, durable homes. That's amazing. Almost makes you choke up. Whew. Anywho, so cool. Wow, I'm sorry. Betsy Bob, I'm getting really pumped. I'm really passionate about this. But so realtor fields, green MLS fields, these are standardized 500 dur I can't believe I'm crying right now. Maybe I had too much coffee. <laughs> so these are for uh, terms in the MLS, and uh, they organize comparable sales data to be researched and used in establishing value. It is imperative that if we have, there's a lot of different green fields, and we need to use them to help appraisers. We've got it. It's up to us, folks. It's easy. We got this. We just need to start using them um, and help appraisers, help people trying to buy green homes, help people trying to sell green homes, uh, value green homes. Um, easy peasy. We know how to do that. Um, one thing that's very important in valuing green buildings is third-party verification. It's kind of like organic food. Unfortunately, it costs more money to say that you did it right, um, but otherwise, for you to know that they did it right, right? Oh, I did it right. No, you, you unfortunately, we do need third-party verifications because um, people lie. So, and sometimes people are mistaken. Um, but those are by way of green certifications and energy labels. These are examples of some prominent ones. 
different rating systems, but they're all recognized by the Appraisal Institute. Um, on the right, HERS index is important because this is actually just a performance number that you get when you do a blower door test, your HERS rating. It looks at your building envelope, your insulation levels, your windows, performance, et cetera, your HVAC, and how tight your building is, and it gives you a score. Um, the reference code built home is a 100. If you have a HERS score of 65, that means you're saving 35% as much energy as a standard home. Um, you can have, so the lower the number, the better, and you can have negative numbers. If you have a building that is producing energy, so you see a zero energy home at zero, that means annually it doesn't use any more energy than um, it requires. If you have net positive energy, um, then you'll have a negative first number because it makes more energy than it uses per year. Um, so here is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, this is the residential green and energy efficiency addendum. There is a commercial uh, component to this as well. And it's a long addendum. It's a standardized form by the Appraisal Institute. And this is where you codify all of what the hell I've been talking about. <laughs> all of the systems. You know, if it's got solar panels on the roof, that's a power plant, and we need to talk about that system here. And um, there's a tool called PV value that will help. Um, so let me back up a little bit. Uh, valuation, as we probably hopefully remember from our real estate classes, there's several different ways to establish value, comparable sales, income approach, and cost. So when you are valuing a property um, with solar on the roof, essentially that's a power plant. So what you would do is value the home or what they do, um, value the home based on comparable sales. And then that power plant on the roof, if it's host owned, it's different if it's third party leased, but if it's host owned, um, you can calculate contributory value um, by way of cost. Actually, that's a way of income because it creates income, essentially. It, it, you save energy and you make money. So um, valuing high-performance buildings, we need to use more than just comparable sales because there's not a lot of comparable high-performance homes. So we get to put our thinking cap on and blend all of these uh, valuation studies. Um, and this is really important to do it. Um, so that's one big piece of the puzzle. Another, there's a lot of big pieces of puzzle. It's a giant puzzle, but we love puzzles. Um, and so another big part of the team, as always, is the lender. Lenders have your favorite lender. They need to have certified green appraisers on their panel um, because you cannot request a specific appraiser, but Fannie Mae does say you are allowed to request a competent appraiser. Um, these buildings are different types of buildings, and um, you can mandate that you um, need a competent appraiser. Obviously, if both sides working with an agent, both sides of the transaction to make that happen to where someone doesn't have to come out of pocket to pay for a better home. So um, collectively, those things are used, uh, financing and appraisals. There's different types of loans, renovation loans, energy efficiency mortgages, and energy improvement mortgages. Um, these take energy savings into account when counting debt to income ratio. Um, and sometimes the improvements can be rolled into a mortgage and tax deductible. So again, um, Fannie Mae, the, the real estate industry really cares about, I mean, they really have ears to hear because of resilience, again, because there's assets that may not have a 30-year mortgage soon, but um, they also are getting more sophisticated tools to realize that people are going to save money on energy so they're, they can spend a little bit more on the house and adjust their debt to income ratios accordingly. Um, here's another image of Grow Community. This is, now we're just back to some pretty pictures. Um, well, I guess first, any questions on real estate valuation? Kind of a high level topic or any, keep going. Cool, let me keep rolling. Um, so going back to um, Grow Community in Bainbridge Island, this is an example, you know, what how we need to be building in our urban course. We need to do more with less. Uh, this is a really awesome site plan. You know, it's kind of the, the funness, adds a little variety. And like I said, there's places to grow food. The HOA maintains the foodscape. Um, of course, there's some private decks and stuff as well. They're producing power. 
the light awesome. Notice they don't all park. There's a, a aggregated parking. And that's another thing that we've got to make. We've got trade-offs, right? Um, they have to walk to their house, but it's a decompressing, amazing um, walk where you can see your neighbors and grow healthy food. Um, here's some more pictures of that development. Again, it's just kind of really a showcase of a lot of these systems and how the built environment could look uh, as these things get pulled together. Um, this is an example. These are actually projects I've been working on. Um, this is a barn in Whooping Crane Farm. Uh, we're not going to build it, but we're doing uh, architecture for it. It just finished it up, and it's going to have a full it's Whooping Crane Farm in Bell's Bend. It's a heritage farm. It's in the land trust. Um, it has solar panels, solar array to the south. You can see daylighting, big ass skylights to the north for daylighting. Um, it is pre insulated metal panels, which means they're rigid foam panels. Um, we were looking at all wood last year, and of course, wood is bananas expensive right now. So we're using um, foam, but again, specification matters. It is a foam that has a low global warming potential. So um, and of course, it'll be very durable for the farm. Um, this is a house that I've designed that we're actively framing right now. This is off Charlotte Avenue. This is the one that's going to use the wood insulation, continuous insulation, and we're doing a lot of low, basically all of the uh, assembly details I've ever wanted to do are in here. Um, you can see the little carport roof. It's going to flex to the outdoor event space. We've got a roof the gutter, going to a rain chain over a boulder spill, you know, um, in addition to performance, there's a lot of ways that just tie into the natural environment and kind of celebrate and elevate human life. Um, let's see. And then here I am. If you'd like to get in touch with me, Betsy.Latrell at Gmail is my real estate email. <laughs> um, Burp tree, Betsy, that should be Betsy at maypopbuilds.com. Um, is architecture construction. Um, follow me on the Instagram at BetsyBaum.com or Maypop Builds. And that's all I got. Wow. That is awesome. Betsy, you, you have done an impeccable job of giving a very intense overview of, of so many things in, in a, this time. I can't thank you enough um, for your sharing. Any questions from anyone about about all these initiatives or pieces that Betsy shared? Like on the uh, valuation side, are, talk a little bit about like retrofitting because we have so many homes in Nashville that are you know, built in the 50s and, and things like that. Uh, how can people benefit from an, uh, an energy like a change in their energy consumption on an already existing home for a better valuation or, or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How can they create value by retrofitting an existing home? Is that your thing? Um, yeah. So obviously value comes with a lot. Money is not the only coin of importance. So I think it's always important to remind people durability, health, comfort, all those things are incredible value. But of course, money is where the rubber hits the road. So um, it's not really in this market, in some other markets, there's a Pearl certification that is coming, um, it's definitely in Boston, it's in different markets, and that's kind of interfacing the real estate market um, as a way to show value in third-party certified um, homes. So as far as our existing market, it's not really here as much, but Pearl certification is being used in other markets. Um, Creating value, I mean, energy savings through air sealing and insulation levels. I will say, you know, you need to manage thermal and moisture in equal. Uh, you can't just add a ton of insulation and be like, ooh, I'm done, because then the building as a science system doesn't work holistically. So you can save air infiltration, the way that um, air, air just leaking out of a building that contributes to about 15% energy loss. I mean, it's really kind of the non-sexy stuff, um, but documentation is key. So your HVAC system upgrading to, um, I have a client, uh, Maria Bermudez and I have an awesome deal and we're getting to um, invest in a whole bunch, upgrade all these systems. So currently there's a gas packaged um, unit 
that is dead, and we are uh, changing that to um, all electric heat pumps. So um, they have a very high steer rating. I mean, that's going to translate to huge energy savings. So it really comes down to the systems for energy management is really going to be the value. And the value play being you're going to save energy. And then at if it's very ther thoroughly documented at resale, having the green efficiency addendum, having all of the receipts. Um, uh, there's a company in town called E3 Innovate, which I'm sure folks have, have heard of. They have a great consultation service um, that focus on the envelope and the system and be kind of a turnkey solution for folks. Um, yeah, as far as the money, the value, if you will, most people think of green building as energy efficiency, and that is important. But, you know, now that Nashville is becoming so, you know, the third coast and there's all these folks coming from New York and California, these people have vastly different uh, market expectations. They're used to healthy places. They're used to prioritizing wellness. So a lot of that healthy materials, low VOC paint, efficient appliances, um, Energy Star, Energy, Energy Star, Water Sense, Indoor Air Quality Plus. These are all EPA, kind of like the low hanging fruit of green re rating systems. Um, so that would be the biggest stuff is how you heat and cool your air, um, your appliances, um, how they save energy, and then your building envelope, making sure it's airtight and well insulated, but that that is done holistically um, to make sure the building is kind of, it's, it's, it's tough because buildings are so complex. I wish there was an easy answer, but um, I think it's a good starting point. And then, of course, ears to hear for healthy buildings. Yeah, again, healthy materials, foodscapes. I mean, um, perennial foodscapes established landscapes, people want to live in the city for all the cultural benefits of nightlife and restaurants, et cetera, but it's getting pretty real. <laughs> it's pretty urban in some areas, so I think a lot of people soft it for, uh, will benefit from a softened landscape and privacy and buffer and bird song and things like that. I mean, a lot of people will pay money for, people will pay a lot of money for anything right now, but um, certainly those things are really top-notch. Wait, uh, I have a personally I have a property it's uh 1.2 acres but I'm I'm off of Dickerson so I'm like just a minute minutes from downtown so I have a big lot for living in the city um and I every day feel so bad that it's just grass and I'm paying to mow it or I'm mowing it myself and I'm like I look at my neighbors like I mentioned earlier and they're this vast, amazing garden, vegetables and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm racking my brain to think about how can I either make something awesome for the community or all the way to like, how do I lease this to my neighbor so he can, he's talked about extending his garden. And it's like, it's an awesome piece of property. It's just like, I feel like it's such a waste of mm -hmm. space. <laughs> I don't know. Looking for yeah, some ideas. That's an awesome idea. Um, so green homes are obviously my jam, but they exist with, you know, foodscapes and productive landscapes. I mean, we spend all this time, energy, and resources. So chemical-free maintenance plans, things like that add value. Um, my buddies at National Foodscape, Jeremy Leckett, started National Foodscapes a long time ago, and now they're just crushing it. Um, I'm bringing them in on several projects and vice versa, and we're looking holistically at how property um, can do all the things that we're talking about here. So um, definitely give them a call and tell them I sent you if you give them a ring. Um, leasing it to your neighbor is a great passive way to do it. I mean, letting it go to clover <laughs> and, uh, you know, different types of meadows. There's a lot of a lot of stuff we could do with the land. And again, it, it's real easy for talks like this to make you feel bad. I mean, there's plenty of stuff. I mean, I live in an old crappy house. And my HAC is literally leaking through my living room right now we need to get it fixed but um you just got to get in where you fit in and get started somewhere so um just, i mean pollinator gardens that's one of the easiest things to do flowers wildflowers even if you did a, a a strip of it just for kind of refuge wildlife habitat where it's low low hanging fruit annual vegetables are a ton of work perennial food forest is a term for uh, forest is an ecosystem from like plants at the ground to tall trees, and they work as a resilient system. 
takes a lot to establish them, but after they're established, um, they're very productive and minimize um, input. And National Foodscapes folks are all over that. They'll design, build, design, install, and maintain, or anywhere along that spectrum. So they work with people to connect them to their, their land and their gardens. So. My gosh, that's, where, are there any any um, communities in town that you are, you know, that you feel are being more uh, in tune with mm -hmm. this or more progressive in this area? Or yeah. Builders um, yeah. yeah. So um, you know, frequently if there's a big is it's historically been proven that the more affluent um, the way I say it, white neighborhoods typically have all the great street trees, all the big trees, and that we have environmental injustice um, in our city. So I'd like to say that some of the best examples are um, places that most people couldn't get into. But like, for instance, Boche is an amazing development. They actually did this whole, the whole site plan based on preserving trees. And they spun that into just luxury because, I mean, trees pretty soon, Nashville's known for its greenery and its canopy, but pretty soon... <laughs> Canopy is going to be a luxury, and so preserving these specimen trees, uh, that's a lot of value. Um, so Foche was a great landscape. I actually, when I was with uh, Mayo Latin Architects, worked with them and Hawkins Partners on a 65-acre master plan, uh, I think it was 65, for uh, Studio 615 property. We did a whole walking trail, so it was trail-oriented housing. It's, on, it's been entitled for that. They haven't actually started developing it yet, but the SP allows for some really cool housing types, tree houses, townhomes, mix of houses, and it's all, you know, cars are at the back and it connects uh, via, via trails. Um, let's see, I mean, a lot of multifamily buildings, um, well, not a lot of them, but some of them are done better. I actually, when I worked at Smithy Studio, I got to design 1260 Martin in Wedgwood Houston, that the village office was in. And so um, that was really, because I was an architect and I was trying to like, well, if people can buy fancy countertops, you know, pay more for fancy countertops, can we do an eco upgrade? Um, and so I'm like, don't even know what I'm talking about, but like, hey, let's do an eco upgrade and how can I bring something to the table that was, could be upsell? So here's the big idea. And I would, I would just say that I am available for consultation. I have so much information, so much deal that I really do see myself as, um, I definitely have my own niche projects that I want to work on, but would love to be a little sidecar on other people's motorcycles <laughs> to help do more. Um, and part of that, I think part of the solution is pre-selling. You obviously have to build a, um, you have to have experience and a body of work because people are afraid to buy buildings before they're built because renderings are easy, but nice buildings are harder. So there's some trust there. But I believe and I want to explore pre-selling sustainable upgrades with virtual reality um, in a way that could transfer the cost from, you know, a developer or a builder to a buyer that wants this. And you can upgrade and invest in those ways um, in stride with the construction, you know, in a way that makes sense for construction and development. Um, so definitely would be down to help people with that. Um, yeah, it is nice. tough. I mean, it's, yeah. I love it. Well, Betsy, awesome. I'm so glad to hear. I know you, you mentioned you're available for consultation. And so again, for everyone that joined us here today, we're so glad that you were able to make it and let's give a huge hand for, for Betsy and all the wonderful things. And uh, <clears throat> Just, just who you are and what you're passionate pursuing, and we're so we're so lucky to have your expertise as part of our team. And I thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me know how I can be a, of assistance. Even if you just need a quick call, or I'm a hype girl, nature's hype girl. You need you need a yes girl. Give me a ring. Do you do cons the consulting that you do? If we have a client that would like to look at optimizing their home, is that something that we could? you have a package for that or something that we could put you in touch with a client? And obviously, you know, I know you're certainly respectable to, of all of our client relationships, but we don't have to be worried that you're a realtor as well, but can certainly consult with them. Like, 
hey, here are some affordable ways in which you could improve your home. Yeah, I mean, definitely understand the, um, not, not trying to uh, swoop anybody's clients by any means. Um, and it depends on the, because I am building a business and it, I'm really trying to build an ecosystem of businesses to help facilitate market transformation. So all that to say, um, I am probably best suited for um, bigger projects. I mean, E3 Innovate is a great one for like, hey, just what can I do? I just want some caulk and some insulation. Perfect. Like if you want like real sophisticated outside the box um, stuff if they're shopping for land, feasibility, you know, or doing additions and renovations, I would probably say that's my highest best use. I really have not developed a package, but I really want to um, because I want to have more impact um, in that way. Um, so I'm certainly open for any suggestions <laughs> people have on that front. I've got a lot of uh, knowledge and zeal and still trying to uh, figure out the business mechanisms that can help Village be a leader in sustainable real estate in Nashville. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm big ideas, creative problem solving um, is probably my my highest and best use. And I whether that's walking a project, um, I'm building up Maypop building workshop as a to where I need more people to help me be able to price um, different upgrades, even if it's just aesthetic and um, so all coming online and changing daily but i would just say if you have an idea weird or out there or even straightforward just give me a ring and based on that we can talk about it and if i can't help you i'll certainly point you towards someone that could sweet <clears throat> thanks again betsy have a great day everyone we appreciate you go green as well Woo <laughs> bye guys see ya